You do know what today is, right? I hope you do, or I wore this tie for nothing, right? <laughs> I, have, I have often said I'm going to fly my flag anytime I can. Yeah. If you cut me, I hope I, I hope I bleed red, white, and blue. I love this nation, don't you? I love this nation. I haven't always, in, in, in certain ways, I've always respected it. From the time that I was little, I can well remember that on certain times of the year when we would gather up, my great-grandmother, uh, Mama Lissy, would sit and she would rehearse the family history. If we went to Blackjack Cemetery and we were decorating the graves, she would tell the stories. That one fought in this war and that one fought in that war. And scattered all through that cemetery was the monuments of those men who had suffered and sacrificed for this nation and the families that they left behind to serve their country as they thought they could and should. And that was in Vietnam and there was fresh graves everywhere. And so as a young boy looking around, it meant something to me because the, 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 the history of our family, the McCraney family and, and our lineages, our ancestry, is bathed in blood and written in the, in, in the blood of this nation from the time that they came over as immigrants to the time to this today. There has always been a McCraney that's fought for this nation. There has always been someone in our lineage, somewhere, somebody somewhere in our ancestry. Somebody has taken a stand and somebody has suffered and sacrificed for the red, white, and blue. I hope we never forget that. We seem to be living in a, in a, in a, in a world and in a time and in an age when they're trying to dismiss and dumb down our history. We can't allow that, folks. We cannot allow that. And I've asked before and I'll say again, if you don't do it, who will? You cannot trust, and I hate to say this <laughs> as an educator, you cannot trust your children's future and their belief in God are in this country. You can no longer trust that to be given to your teachers or their teachers. It's up to you. It's not up to them. God gives us the responsibility when we birth a child. God gives to you who are a mother or you who are a father or you and I who are grandmothers or grandfathers. God gives us that duty to teach those children right from wrong. And God gives us that privilege and God gives us that eternal obligation and responsibility to teach them to love their God and to love the country that we've been birthed into. Amen. That being said, I want to share with you the message for a few minutes, Independence Day, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. If you are willing to and able to, you can stand as we share the Word of God. <laughs> now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached unto you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. And after that He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared unto James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, He appeared unto me also as one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am and His grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than them all. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You can be seated. I would, I would share briefly that the day July the 4th, 1776, when those men gathered together in that stifling hot hall of Congress, the representatives of the 13 colonies, United Colonies, not all of them agreed. And not all of them signed the Declaration of Independence. Not all of them did. But even those that did not and could not and would not sign that declaration, 
They honored the, the courage of those that did. They honored those that pledged their allegiance, pledged their lives to that declaration. Do you remember it? You may not be old enough. I am. I can't, rem I, I can't so I wrote it down for you. Allow me to read their words. In Congress, July the 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of Indo the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds and bands that have connected them one with the other and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to this separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are cre created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as, the, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and their happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light or transient causes. And according, accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress, assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of, the, of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have the full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of a right do. And for the support of this declaration with firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Man. I don't know about you, but that still resonates with me. Because I see some 50-some-odd men, the, br the best and the brightest that America had, the best and the brightest that the 13 colonies could offer, they stood there shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm and hand in hand, if you would. And they knew what was facing them. They knew the moment because it had already been obviously shown in all of the 13 colonies the price that would be paid for the rebellion. Many of these men knew when they, took, when they signed this, and I would, I would offer John Hancock that signed it, I believe, first, that wrote it big enough, he said, the King of England can no longer see that well, so I want to make sure he knows who signed it and whose name it is. And I like that because they knew that it would cost them. They knew that they would suffer. They knew that they would have to make a sacrifice. They knew that their lives would be completely altered, eternally changed for the stand that they took. Hallelujah. 
And if I'm not mistaken, I read four times in these uh, few words that their dependence and their reliance and their cause was taken from Christ and from Calvary. That these men were Christians. Not all of them. Some of them had differing philosophical and theological beliefs. Some were deists. But there were some among them that were hardcore evangelical fundamental, fundamentalists, if you take the term. They believed that the Word of God was the Word of God. They believed in salvation by grace through faith. They believed that God was in, con in control. They believed that the sacrifice that God allowed at Calvary of the Son to save sinners like themselves and others, they believe that in that declaration of independence made by God through the blood of a suffering Savior at Calvary some 1,700 years ago at that time, that in that that he did could be found that which they were doing. I like that. They look back to their history some 150 years before, and they realize that when the pilgrims put their foot on, the, on, on American soil, what would be America, they did it so that they could find freedom of religion, so that they could serve their God and they could worship their God according to the beliefs of their hearts, that they could preach, they could teach, they could live, they could love, and they could do so without, without anyone stopping them or preventing them from serving God as they chose. Hallelujah. Yes, they had differing beliefs, the pilgrims and the Puritans, but they both believed in God. They both established colonies and they both established a religious foundation upon which we lean and we rest even to this good day. And so we should thank God that, there were men, that they were men and women and they were men especially of the caliber of these Christians that stood in 1776 in this Hall of Congress and made a stand for the, for the America that was and the America that could be. Amen. As I look at what they did, there's a, a couple of things I draw from it. One was the prescription of freedom. When they looked at Calvary, when they looked at Jesus, when they looked at what it would cost and what it would take, this is the prescription that the doctor gave. It was one that would remedy the needs of humanity. It was a prescription that was given in love. It would require sacrifice. It would require dedication. It would require commitment to the uttermost, determination, and suffering. When Jesus Christ looked out upon the sea of humanity, around him and even to our future, he saw a suffering humanity that had no remedy for their sin. Mankind could not save themselves. Would not if they could save themselves. Mankind would be utterly damned, doomed, and lost. Mankind would be eternally condemned to hell without any way of salvation. And God in His great grace, God in His great love, allowed the Son of God, God the Son, to suffer, bleed, bleed out, and die so that sinners could be saved. Hallelujah. I count myself among that number. Do you? At some point in my life, at some point in your life, I hope it is that you've taken a stand because of the prescription required for your freedom and my freedom and our freedom. I was a sinner condemned to die. I was a sinner under the judgment of hell itself. And I realized that, recognized that, and I didn't want to die and go to hell. And I said, if you would, at an old Baptist church, on an old wooden bench, with the pastor of that church in flip-flops, a t-shirt with a Thompson chain reference Bible, I asked the Lord to save a sorry sinner like me and bless God he did. Amen. And when I took that stand, I didn't take it because my mama told me to or my grandmama told me to or somebody told me to. I took that stand for Jesus because I know I needed liberation. I needed to be saved. I needed to be set free. I needed the shackles that had bound me, the shackles that still condemned me and held me. I needed something to break the bonds of that slavery, to break the bonds of that bondage, if you would, and set me free. And I accepted that Jesus Christ suffered, bled, bled out, and died to do just that. And I accepted what he did, applied it to my life, and because of that, bless God, I'll see heaven one day, will you? The prescription for freedom. In 1776, 
they looked out, recognizing and realizing that there was no hope for the colonies unless somebody suffered, bled, bled out and died. And these men, the men that, that signed this declaration, I'm not sure my memory's failing me, so you don't have to forgive me, but I think I'm close. Nine of those men died in battle of the wounds received fighting for the declaration that they signed. Twelve of them lost everything and spent time in prison. Of the rest of them that signed, almost three quarters of those men that signed that declaration, they paid in their blood, they paid by the loss of property, they paid in some shape, form, or fashion. They paid so that that declaration was more than pen to ink on paper. They meant what they said, they said what they meant, and they were willing to back it up with a loss of anything and everything they had. I'd say that same should hold true for you and I when it comes to Jesus, wouldn't you? It seems to me that it's prudent, and it seems to me that it's only right and righteous that because of what he did for us, we ought to do something for him. And that's something that we can do, that's something that is done for our nation, is those that serve under the red, white, and blue. For us, we serve under a, a rustic cross and three nails that symbolize the suffering of our Savior, the prescription of our freedom, the person of our freedom. In 1776, those men looked out amongst each other. And I was not there, but I can only imagine that they looked out the windows to those boys and girls, men and women that were going about their daily affairs oblivious to what was going on inside to some extent. Unknowing and unaware and probably unconcerned. And yet those men inside that congressional hall, having read, having agonized, and having written this document, and now having signed that document, they looked out realizing their lives would eternally change. That it could not and would not be the same from hereafter that none of their lives would, be, would ever be as it was. Is that not how it should be for you and I with Jesus? I, 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 I'm not trying to be ugly, but I am trying to be honest. God help us. If we are so uncommitted and we lack the dedication to see the commitment through to the bitter end, if necessary, of what Jesus did for you and I, the person of Jesus Christ, it took a long warrior not with sword, not with spear, not with a gun, not with any kind of weapon other than the weapon of courage and conviction. And that solitary warrior on the battlefield of eternity suffered, bled, bled out, and died so that you and I could have a stake on what we call freedom. You know, the only thing stopping us from enjoying the freedoms that we have is the courage of our conviction and the dedication to see those things through. The person of our freedom is Jesus Christ. In the Word of God, it proclaims simply this truth. If you and I and others accept and affirm that which Jesus said, that if you will ask me to save you, again, salvation is by grace through faith. I've asked you before, I'll say again, what does Jesus and the Happy Meal have in common? Allow me to elaborate for a second. Have you ever eaten a Happy Meal or a hamburger? Have you ever eaten frozen food or have you ever eaten canned food? Have you ever eaten anything like that? Of course you have. Did you grow the food? Did you grow the cow? Did you kill the cow? Did you process the cow? Did you follow that cow all the way from where it was to where it wound up? Did you cook it in the restaurant and you ate that Happy Meal? Or you ate that Burger King? Or you ate that out of the... If you didn't can it and you ate it, or you didn't, can, you didn't freeze it and you ate it, that's faith. What about surgery? I've been cut on so much, I'm going to have like crossword puzzles on me, man, you know? And I, I didn't... Uh, did you go to school with a doctor or dentist? And yet you let them operate on you? My brothers and my sisters, the same kind of faith it takes for you and I to eat a Happy Meal is the same kind of faith that it takes to go to heaven. Is that somebody made a witness, you accepted their testimony, and you acted in personal faith on that which they said, and you found it to be true. And when you found it to be true, you became a disciple. I am a disciple of banana pudding. 
I will share the good news of banana pudding and Jesus wherever I may go because I have a personal witness about banana pudding. And I'm not ashamed to speak the, the, the message of truth about banana pudding. And if I can do that about a banana pudding, don't you think I ought to do that about Jesus? Because of the price and the person of Jesus Christ. And also the promise. Golly, my mind is going to slip on me again. One of the most famous British explorers, Drake, Francis Drake, when he was trying to get up a, and I, I think it was Drake, if not, forgive me. When he was trying to get up a, a load of young men to come to the new world, this was the advertisement that was placed on the poles around Britain. I can promise you no more than suffering and possible death. I can promise you nothing more than agonizing uh, cold and heat and enemies and all kinds of dangers. I'm, I'm ab living if you will forgive me. But if you will accept this challenge, you will be part of the greatest adventure that you will ever have in your life. Do you know that they had so many young men show up to get on that ship? They had to turn most of them away. Doesn't that blow your mind? You would think that's a horrible, that's horrible advertising. That you and I would think that, uh, that, that the threat of, uh, of death or the threat of injury, that that would be something that would, that would be incentive for me to take the adventure. John Drake, if this is the, the man I'm thinking about, realized that in the human heart is the need of adventure and the need of some uncertainty. And in that challenge itself is found the courage of the individual. That any one of us can sit back and do nothing. But it takes something to stand up and do something. Amen? And so Jesus gives us this promise if we would accept the conditions of freedom. He promises to deliver us from the penalty of sin. He's done that one time forever. My Bible tells me, if I've read it correctly, that He was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And that when we accept Him, we are, we are crucified, buried, and arisen with Him in newness of life. That who I was has been buried in the grace of God. And so the, there's the, the promise of release from the penalty of sin. There's the promise of release from the power of sin. I don't have to sin. I choose to. You and I say, Brother Lynn, I can't help myself. This ain't Flip Wilson and we ain't Jardine. We can help ourselves. We don't have to sin as we do. We can do better. We simply choose not to. We have the power of resurrection in us, do we not? We have the power of God upon us. We have the Spirit of God within us. We have the Word of God in front of us. We have the promise of God around us. We have the power of God through us. We have the resources necessary to wage effective warfare and come out victorious and triumphant, not because I'm able, but because He has proven to be, and I am found, if I, sh if, if I would, in Him. We are promised freedom from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and one day from the presence of sin. I don't know about you, but I'm somewhat envious and waiting. Don't get me wrong. Do not get me wrong. I'm going to be just as polite as I can until I don't have an option. And I'm going to step aside and let you get on the bus going to heaven if you want to. I want to hang around for a while. Amen. But I know I'm going to heaven. Do you? I know I'm going to heaven. Do you know that you know you're going to heaven? Let's get, let's get to... Do you know? Do you have the assurance if you died right now, you'd go to heaven? Do you have that assurance? If you don't have that assurance, you need to find somebody you can talk to so you can get that assurance. Because if you lack that assurance, you will not be victorious in life. You will not know the freedom of, of salvation. You will not know the, 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 come on, Lynn. You will not know the beauty of the relationship that we have in Christ unless you have the assurance of what Jesus did at Calvary. I know that I know that I'm saved. I know that my sins have been forgiven. I know that my sins have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I know that I am in Christ. I know that I, I sin, but I know that I'm saved. And I know that because of what Jesus did, I'm going to die and go to heaven one day. Amen. 
And because of that, I have the, at least the courage of my conviction that I'm not scared of life and I'm not scared of death because I know that whichever way this thing plays, I know that I know that I know one day I'm going to get all the way through the pearlies and stand in the presence of the Almighty. Amen. Well, it is my hope and prayer that you also have that conviction and you have that promise. Independence Day was declared in 1776 by our forefathers. It was declared at Calvary some 2,000 years ago. And if needed and necessary, this can be the day you declare your own independence. That you're independent not from God, but you can be unshackled from the sins that have bound you. You can find freedom and salvation in Christ Jesus if that's what you need. As we stand and we sing a closing song of invitation, would you come and would you do?